right. Okay, well, I it's five after seven. I'm going to start the meeting. So I'll ask everyone to mute and to shut their video off, uh, except for Steve Hampton. I want to be able to see Steve and our speaker, of course. Uh, I'm Ann Bryce with uh, Hello Audubon, and welcome to everyone. This is our record turnout tonight, uh, and everybody wants to hear oh, Kevin talk Bryce. about Uganda. But before we start that, I wanted to just take a minute or two to say something about Steve Hampton. Steve. Most of you may know by now that Steve and his wife are moving to uh, Port Townsend, Washington. They're leaving us with just within a few weeks. And uh, I'd like to take a minute to recognize him on behalf of the board of uh, Yolo Audubon for all that he's done for Yolo County birding. Steve's has a PhD in natural resource, what is it Steve? Natural resource economics. That's and, right. Yeah. And uh, most recently he worked as deputy administrator at the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, the Office of Oil Prevention, Oil Bill Prevention and Response. Close, right? That's correct, yeah. <laughs> and um, he recently retired and we all just expected him to bird here from dawn to dusk, beyond bon dawn and dusk uh, till the end of his days. But no, he's uh, picked up and he's moving. Uh, you know, he's done so much for Yellow Audubon specifically. I'd like to just go over a few things. Steve, how many years did you do the Christmas bird count and compilation? 20 years for that too? I think 20 or 21, yeah. Yeah, and 20 years for the column in, that's in the, the Burrowing Owl of the recent sightings. And uh, Steve's column and uh, his uh, the posts that he puts on Yolo County or uh, Central Valley birds are so well received because he speaks not only to the expert hardcore birders, but also to the casual birders who uh, really appreciate that he's clear, he was precise in his descriptions, and he was also really good in his locations. He was good with maps. Uh, so we thank him for all of that. And most recently, Steve was the lead author on our new 2019 checklist of the birds of Yolo County. And that was a huge effort, I know, just from watching that at a distance. And he was also uh, very involved in the 2004 version, but the, the 2019 one is out and available if anyone is interested in, in uh, purchasing one. In addition, he writes a blog, uh, the Cottonwood Post. And uh, Steve, that seems to me to be things that kind of catch your interest, whether it's climate change or conservation, you don't have a set. <laughs> Uh, it's birds, birds, birding, and uh, conservation and climate change. Yes. There we go. <laughs> uh, he also has a website, a guide to birding in Yolo County, which is packed full of stuff. And uh, he wrote in one of those that uh, that his uh, my special bird interests are gull identification and fox sparrow subspecies identification. And he also has a fox sparrow. Facebook group. And this is no surprise to those of us who follow Steve even lightly because uh, he can go on forever about hybrid gulls and uh, loses many of us in the process, but, but not, not everyone. Um, you know, in short, Steve has just made a wonderful contribution to birding in, in Yolo County and, and the area and it's gonna be a huge loss. We're going to miss Steve. Uh, he's gonna leave a big gap in the, the uh, birding community. Uh, and on behalf of the board, I wanna say we wish him well. We'll miss you, Steve, but we know that you're uh, well on your way to becoming an integral part of the birding scene in, in Washington. Uh, would you like to say briefly just a couple of words? Sure. Um... Yeah, it's uh, it's hard to leave such wonderful people. And I'm, I'm thinking back when I first came here, um, the the Yolo Audubon to me was um, Kevin Gousset, Michael Perrone, Joan Humphrey, um, um, Ted Beatty, actually, John Kemper, of course, and um, um, and and Bruce Maxwell. 
Um, and um, and uh, boy, the 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 number the the top lister in the county at the time was Rich Stalkop at 263, who didn't even live here anymore. And um, and Ted Beatty was just passing him, and I think Bruce was just behind. And um, and uh, now there's dozens of birders that that have seen over 300 species in Yolo County, which is would have was unfathomable if you would have told me that 20 years ago. Um, and it just speaks to the great community we have here. Um, uh, and it's a really supportive community. Uh, everyone does birding in different ways. Um, there is kind of a competitive culture, but I feel like Yolo County shrugs that off and um, we just kind of support each other and you know, whatever, in whatever way we want to enjoy birds. Um, and I've always appreciated that. Um, and, and the Poudre Creek Christmas Bird County is astounding for the area leaders that still have been leading their areas for decades. Um, and that's, that's a wonderful thing. And, and the other wonderful thing is all the new people that um, you know, usually associated with the university, but, um, but others like um, that, that have come here and are, are now active birders. And so we, we always have this huge supportive network and um, it's just a great environment. I, Port Townsend does not have such, uh, it has some birders, but not as big of a, a group, um, but uh, it has some great birds. Um, so if, if you wanna come up and see Harlequin ducks and ancient murrelets and white winged scoters and long tailed ducks, um, you're welcome, and um, uh, you're, uh, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll join you, I'll show you around. Um, if you're making any trips to Alaska, it's a short flight for me. Um, so I'm happy to, happy to come along there too. Um, and uh, so I, I look forward to, I guess, new, new challenges, a whole new world ecologically. Um, yeah, all new birds, a new ecosystem. That's extremely exciting to me. Um, but it's just been been great going on field trips with you all. And birding was always a solitary thing for me as a kid. I started when I was seven years old. Um, and not till here did I really bird communally. And um, it's been wonderful with all of you. So thank you very much. Okay, thanks so much, Steve. Uh, uh, are you there, Ken? Are you taking over? Hello, Ken. Sorry, I was <laughs> muted while I was complaining about why I couldn't do things or not do things. Um, <laughs> anyway, let me unspotlight Steve, which is something I, a trick I learned from coaching from the audience and there's Steve. So what can I do? Oh. I don't see how to. I can put you in a waiting room, Steve. Um, I'm I'm I don't, I'm I don't still know, here. I don't know how to get you off the front of the screen. My screen says Yellow Audubon Society with the owl. Yeah. Yeah. He's he's off the front of mine. He is, huh? I there's Michael. All right. Let's hope he's not spotlighted anymore. So, hey. Let's uh, introduce Kevin Gousset. Kevin is, uh, as others mentioned, he is a longtime uh, member of uh, Yellow Audubon. He's been a great contributor to Yellow Audubon. Um, I was telling someone, I guess every time Kevin names comes up that uh, every time I go birding with Kevin, I learn something new, uh, which for me, that's not always that hard, um, but I'm really excited to have him speak here tonight. He was scheduled to give this presentation uh, a, March, a year ago, March, uh, when we had to uh, cancel our in-person um, outing um, programs. And um, I'm so happy that Kevin was able to uh, join us again this year with this program on uh, a, a trip to uh, uh, Uganda. And, um, with the fascinating stories of the birds and the, um, the country itself. Uh, let me just introduce Kevin. 
And Kevin, you can you're free to share your screen anytime. And I give the floor to you. Thanks, Ken. Before I start the presentation, I want to personally thank Steve Hampton. I think he's been a, a fantastic um, pillar of, of Yolo County birding and uh, uh, Yolo Audubon Society. And I just think I personally just want to thank him for everything he's done. I really appreciate being out in the field with him. He actually fosters that communal um, birding that he talked about that he enjoys, but uh, he makes that possible for other people as well. So thank you, Steve. We're going to miss you, buddy. Thanks, Kevin. Okay, so I've never done a Zoom PowerPoint presentation, so let's let's see how this goes here. Can everybody see the screen at this point? Seeing your screen here, Kevin. Okay. All right. So as Ken mentioned, this is a trip that we took in uh, 2019, actually. Gosh, I can't believe it's two year, almost two years ago now. And the main reason that I wanted to do the trip, Catherine and I had talked about this for a while. Um, I really wanted to see the mountain gorillas. This is one of those um, bucket list kind of things I wanted to do. And I thought, well, while we're there, let's see what the birds are like and let's see what the big game's like and let's see what the herps are like. So um, luckily for us, Uganda has a lot of all of that. In fact, um, Uganda has over 1100 species of birds and uh, many, many primate species, many, many big game species. It's not the same as Kenya, Tanzania, um, that sort of thing, but it is East Africa and there's a lot more mountainous habitat, which is where you find the, the gorillas. So. It's called the Pearl of Africa because of all the diversity it has in all these different groups. And there's something for everybody, really. Botanists as well. I mean, there's so many unique kinds of plants there, too. Uh, I think Glenn in particular, if Glenn's on this call, I think uh, Glenn would have definitely appreciated the, the plant diversity as well. Okay, I hope this, is that map showing up okay? Well, We'll give it a Kevin, right here. Kevin, if you click at the top line where it says slideshow, uh, you'll get rid of that the line, the, the left hand lineup of all your slides to come. Slide Just below the, there, click there. Yeah, click on that. From beginning? And Is that better? Beginning. Yeah, that does it. Is that better? I'm sorry. Get Thank you, Sammy. I appreciate that. Cool. I'll learn as I go here. Okay, so this is a map that was kindly provided by Catherine Lawrence, who was one of the participants on the trip. This kind of gives you an idea of where Uganda is situated in relation to other countries in Africa. As I mentioned, it's, it borders Kenya, Tanzania, also the Democratic Republic of the Congo, and on the north, there's the South Sudan. So what we did was we did the trip in, in two stages, basically. We flew from San Francisco to um, the Netherlands, okay, Amsterdam, so that was a 10-hour flight. And then there was another 10 hour flight from Amsterdam down to Entebbe. We kind of did it in two groups because some people wanted to go earlier and acclimate. Um, six of us spent two days in Amsterdam and that was pretty cool because I'd never been to Europe before. So I really enjoyed that as well. We got a little birding in as well as some cultural stuff. So, so here's where we flew in Entebbe. And the tour we took was called the Remarkable West. It was organized by Avian Safaris. Um, a local tour operator, the fellow who runs the group, it's called Krami Wanyama. And he is absolutely the best combination of people person, logistic wizard, and incredible birder that I've been on any, I've been on several trips now to several countries and he was by far the best. So if anybody wants information on him later, I'd be happy to share my email address or, or you can text and I'd be happy to give you his information. He was absolutely fabulous. I cannot recommend him highly enough. He was, he was just fantastic. He was actually under the weather during the first like third of the trip and still he's spotting birds, he's making the driver stop as we're tooling along the highway for to find things that are miles and miles away. He, he was just absolutely amazing. So, and the other thing is he's kind of keyed into technology. He's got um, several other people that lead for his company as well as he employs local guides at each place you go to. So when those other groups spot a particular species of interest, they plug in the GPS coordinates. So Steve will appreciate this. So then these are these are available to, to Crammy when he's leading our group, right? So he looks in his phone and goes, oh yeah, this is where this should be. Stop the bus. <laughs> and 
and we get out and we look and and more times than not we had the species that uh, we were trying to get at, at a spot that you would have never i would have never guessed going into it so so the tour is called the remarkable west so starting in Tebby, we did kind of a clockwise thing we went um down to Bawindi and lake maburu um up through the the mountains where the gorillas are followed the nile between lake albert and and uh lake edward uh over to murchison falls and then back down to the east and back down to um Entebbe again um there is a really good national park up here called Kadepo national park but it's so far away from most of the other spots we did on the tour we just didn't have time to get it in um we could have seen things like ostriches, secretary bird, and that sort of cheetahs, that sort of thing, if we've been able to get up there, because it, as you can see, it's really close to Kenya. So it has a lot of affinities with the, the big game species over there. So here's our group. Um, Greg Schwab down in front, my lovely wife, Denise. There I am. Roger and Greta Adamson, Catherine Lawrence, Sonia Sorbo. Roger Marlowe, and there's our great guide, Crammy. And let me tell you, this smile never leaves his face. No matter what kind of a day he's having or how he feels, this golden smile is, is there every single day. He was just a real pleasure to, to tour with. So this is one of the places we stayed. It's called uh, the Lake Victoria View Guest House. And as you might imagine, it is actually pretty close to Lake Victoria. You get a little bit of a view from there. Um, the main thing about this though is, and this was one of the first places we stayed, these beautiful gardens behind the bungalows that you get to stay in were really, really attractive to birds. We saw some really, really good birds just right here on the premises before we actually formally did any part of the tour. So here's one of the birds we saw there. This is called a broad-billed roller. Saw some African yellow white eyes. This is a pretty widely distributed um, group of birds. There's even a species in Hawaii, what you think has been split out now, used to be called the Japanese white eye. But um, yeah, so they're even introduced into Hawaii. So they're all over the old world, all, all different species in different countries. So there's several different weaver species in Africa. Um, this is a called a, I'm going to butcher the name, sure, a Baglefect weaver. Um, it was hanging out on the power lines just outside of our lodge, just outside of the driveway, pretty much. They make these really intricate nests. I'll have some slides later on that show um, some of the adults actually working on the nest, but it's pretty amazing. These big hanging nests, sort of like you might associate with uh, if you guys have um, been to the tropics and seen oropendulas in Central and South America, um, sort of those big hanging nests like that. We saw several species of sunbird. This is called a red chested sunbird. Um, unfortunately, it seemed like when we saw the greatest diversity of sunbirds, we had the worst weather. <laughs> really heavy overcast, even some rain. Um, and on a side note, it was supposed to be the beginning of the dry season, but because of climate change and the way things are going in the world these days, um, we actually ended up being there at the tail end of the wet season. So we had quite a bit of rain while we were there and the guide, that was kind of unexpected going into it. So we had to do our best some days and look between the, the droplets. <laughs> So this bird is called the Hadada ibis. And as you can see, they're pretty well adapted to uh, life around the bungalows. They forage a lot in the lawns right below where we were staying in, the, in adjacent uh, establishments. Um, the colors are actually kind of reminds you of our white-faced ibis, but it's much larger, bulkier bird. And it seemed like much more terrestrial, more dry habitats where we saw them. This is a really neat bird called the black-headed gonalek. It's in a group of birds called the bush strikes. And we were fortunate right in front of the dining area, there was this nest and the adults kept coming back and forth to the nest trading off. So it was kind of neat to see them, see them nesting there as well. So I should backtrack a little bit. Overall, we saw over 500 species of birds, which is pretty amazing. And the cool thing for me, not having been to the old world was more than 500 of those were life birds for me as well, so. This is from one of my favorite groups of birds that we saw on the trip. It's called the Taracos. This particular one's called the Ross's Taraco. Look at the beautiful colors in the, in the top knot and also in the underwings when it's flying. And it's got this beautiful purple iridescence um, even when they're perched. Really amazing birds. They kind of remind me of the uh, guans and the curacaos of the, of the New World. Pretty much that size and very similar um, niche that they occupy. 
So we did five different boat trips um, in this tour, which was really cool. So we got to get up close and personal with a lot of the wildlife and birds that we wouldn't have been if we'd stayed on dry land. In fact, um, the first place we went to is called Mabamba Swamp. And it's known for um, the shoebills. The shoebill is the bird you want to get here. It's the best place in all of Africa, all the world actually, to see this bird. It's very prehistoric looking and uh, it occurs in these papyrus swamps. This is papyrus here. So what you do is you take one of these motorized canoes out. Um, there's Roger Greta, our guide, and there's a local guide. And what happens is all these guides are in radio contact. So when one group um, spots the shoe bill, they radio back to everybody else. And then everybody kind of cruises in and make sure they don't disturb the bird, but make sure everybody gets a, a good look at it. So here they are. And these things are really monsters. I mean, they are about four, four and a half feet tall. They have this gigantic bill. I guess they primarily feed on lungfish, uh, which is actually a pretty good sized prey item. And they literally can sit here motionless for hours from what I've heard. And in fact, this guy looked like he kind of took a snoozer here on us. <laughs> so we saw these African jasanas in many places, including Mbamba Swamp. Very similar in shape and behavior to the jasanas in our part of the world. We went to this other location um, around Entebbe, the Botanical Gardens. And these Botanical Gardens have been here for 120 years. So the vegetation is, as you can imagine, very well developed. Um, it's got native vegetation, it's got exotic vegetation, and it's right along the edge of uh, Lake Victoria. So you have aquatic species on the edge, you've got terrestrial species up in these big trees. In fact, it was speculated that some of the 1960s Tarzan movies were actually filmed here. I mean, there's no verification for that, but as you walk around in here, um, these trees are truly gigantic. So it wouldn't surprise me if they had actually done some of that. This is one of the herons we saw on the trip. And there were a lot of, lot of wading birds. Um, herons, egrets, storks, uh, more stork diversity than I could have ever imagined. They're all really unique and, and really neat. Um, so this is the black headed heron, a little bit smaller than our great blue heron, but kind of the same sort of pattern there. This was one of my favorite groups of birds from the trip. This is called a crowned hornbill. Um, we saw several different hornbill species on the trip and they were all really, really neat. This gigantic bill is something else. Um, one thing that's unique about the hornbills is during the breeding season, the male actually walls the female up in a cavity and feeds her through this hole in the, in the, in the tree. And that's where she stays until the, the eggs are hatched and he keeps going back and forth, bringing her food. So it's really kind of an interesting um, behavior pattern that they have. So now we're on our way to the next spot. And on the way, we stop in this village and check out this greater blue eared starling. Um, I don't wanna say we got gypped when it came to starlings, but we really did. <laughs> All the starlings in Africa are absolutely beautiful, at least the ones that we saw. So this is just one example. And this was just right, right in the middle of a village that we were passing through. So this is another species of gondolek. This is called the papyrus gondolek. And we had to stop at a particular location that Crammy knew of. And I think this is where his GPS coordinates came in um, specifically to, to see this bird. Um, I guess they're associated almost entirely with papyrus. And there's only actually a few locations within the papyrus where you can hope to get them. So we got lucky on this one. We tried several times and this was kind of like our last effort to see it before we moved on to the next location. So we had things like this purple heron in flight. Um, it actually reminded me a lot of, if you guys have seen the tricolored herons here in uh, North Central and South America, um, about the same size and it had a lot of the stripes and streaks down the neck, sort of like the, the tricolored heron does as well. It's about the same size also. So next we moved on to Lake Maburu National Park. And this is our first look at what I considered to be at least in my mind, before I came on the trip, this is what Africa should look at, look like, you know, this, uh, this thorn scrub, savanna, open grasslands, termite mounds, um, and vistas like this, where you can just, seems like you can see forever. So one of the, the cool raptors we saw was this long crested eagle. Um, I got helped by the breeze a little bit, so it really knocked his crest up. But these guys were out just like our red tails would be out on telephone poles. Um, we saw them in several different locations. So they certainly didn't seem to be associated maybe with any particular habitat type, but uh, 
very much a generalist and very obvious in several spots that we were. So we also saw this bird called a hammer cup and it's in its own family. And you can see why it was named that looking at the shape of the head there. And over on the right, I have a picture of the nest of the hammer cup. Look at the size of that nest. It's bigger than any eagle or osprey nest I've ever seen in my life. And I guess they add to it year after year. And, and sometimes it just pulls the trees down. They're so big. So for reference, Here's one of the hammer cups up here. They're like two, maybe two and a half feet tall. So look at that in comparison to the size of the nest. It's just enormous. So one of the specialty birds you go for when you're at Lake Maburo is you go for this African finfoot. And uh, Greg Schwab's sharp eye spotted this for us. This was on one of our boat trips. So we saw this as we were cruising along. Um, this is related to the sun grebes, if any of you have seen the sun grebes. There's actually only three species in this family, and this is this is one of those. So, in body shape is very much like a very much like a sun green. Very skulky. They stay in the in the branches and and out of sight for the most part. Uh, we got lucky with this one. It kind of jumped off this log and swam a little bit along the shore, so we got pretty good looks at it for a while. So this is a twofer. I always wanted to see African buffalo. Um, I'd heard about how dangerous they are and how fierce and all that. So. We happened to catch this uh, African buffalo taking a bath. And look at this. He's got his own little jockey here. This is called a yellow-billed oxpecker. And uh, what they do is they hang around large ungulates and they walk along their, their backs and they'll pick parasites off. So it helps the large ungulates with the parasite load. So I guess there's several species in Africa, but this is the only one we saw on our trip, yellow-billed oxpecker. So this is one of those birds that uh, when I was growing up, I had my, my first National Geographic magazine had a whole article on the African fish eagle. So from that time, I think I was about eight years old till now I really wanted to see these guys. Um, it's definitely one of the iconic birds of uh, Africa. They occur on most large water bodies. So lakes, rivers, um, we saw them every time we took a boat trip, pretty much we saw them. Um, they were around Lake Victoria and I've actually got, whoops. Let me go back. I had an audio clip, but I don't see it here. So I don't know if that came through. They make this really um, raucous call. So they'll, they'll perch, they'll, the male and female will sit perched on the top of a tall tree and they'll just duet back and forth and throw their heads all the way back and just let off the sound that you probably have heard like in a Tarzan movie or, or one of the movies that, that talks about the tropics. It's very, very um, characteristic of Africa. Our guide said that that's when you hear that sound, you know you're in Africa. So here's, here's our first hippopotamus, which was very exciting. Um, I didn't have any idea how aggressive and how mean they were to each other <laughs> before this trip. They were always biting and fussing and tussling. And in fact, in one of the places we went, um, our guide told us that the females actually stash the babies amongst herds of African buffalo when the buffalo are in their big herds of the water. And the reason for that is because the males are so aggressive and fighting so often that a lot of times the young ones will get trampled in the process or get bitten or get drowned because they can't get out of the way fast enough. So um, these guys definitely cause the most fatalities of any large mammal in Africa. Um, they tip boats over. The fishermen that are in these areas are extremely careful. All of our boat drivers were very cognizant of where the hippo herds were and kept a, kept a healthy distance. So um, we actually saw them out of water a couple of times as well. Um, you usually don't see that except at night, but we actually were lucky and I'll show you later those slides. Uh, we actually were able to see them during the daytime, which was pretty neat. So this is the battler, which is another raptor. This is an immature. Um, the adults have this nice black and white pattern, but unfortunately we didn't get any that were that close. So I did get a picture of the kids though, and here he's, he's yakking at us. He's, we're in the bus and we stopped and looked at him and he just called and called and called. So one thing that's interesting about them is check out the length of the um, wings compared to the tail. Very, very long wing bird. They almost look a little bit like a, a boomerang when they're in the air, when they're flying, because that tail is so short. This is another raptor we saw, and by the way, we saw over 40 raptor species on this trip. So if you're a raptor file like me, this is definitely a place you want to go. Um, so many different kinds of raptors. Every day, several species. Uh, it was just, it was mind boggling. Uh, this is called a lizard buzzard, and we saw this in several locations on the trip. 
very confiding. Um, again, you can see them in the vegetation. We saw some on telephone wires. Um, very, very common bird. Kind of reminds me a little bit of a, Ken and I were talking about this, kind of reminds me a little bit of a, of a gray hawk that you'd get in the new world. We also saw our first and only zebras in Lake Maburu National Park. Um, they only occur, I guess, right now in two national parks in Uganda. So a lot of the big game species are trying to recover now in Africa and in Uganda, especially. Um, during Idi Amin's reign, there was a lot of uh, wholesale slaughter. And so some of these guys are just starting to come back. But uh, this was our only place we saw zebras, but it was really cool to see them. These patterns are just, just incredibly beautiful. It really is a neat, neat creature. We also saw Franklins, which I guess are related to chuckers and that sort of thing on the trip. We saw three or four species. This was the largest and most visible, the red-necked Franklin. The only place we saw Impala, um, Lake Maburu National Park. Um, these are the ones you usually see on the wildlife shows where uh, a cheetah is trying to want, run one down. They're really, really fast and really, really alert and really beautiful, really beautiful and graceful animals. So we saw several species of antelope on the trip. So uh, that's another reason to go to Uganda. I didn't expect that we'd see as many big game animals as we did. So that was a real treat. They have old world orioles in Africa. This is the African black-headed oriole. And this is one of my favorite antelope of the trip. This is called the Lelwell hartebeest. Um, look at this pattern. It's just beautiful, the dark and light and kind of rusty and the horns are really ornate. Um, really, really neat animal. We didn't see any wildebeest, which is interesting. I didn't really know why, but I guess they mostly occur further east so than where we were. Here's a couple of birds called bare-faced go-away bird. And <laughs> I'm not sure exactly why they call them that. Uh, I understand the bare-faced thing, but the go-away bird, I'm not quite sure I get. Anyway, we saw these late in the afternoon. And it, they're perched on this plant called a uh, candle, candelobrium. Uh, Glenn, you, forgive me here. I don't know if I'm getting that exactly right, but um, it's a succulent that looks like a cactus, but it's not a cactus. So, but it occurred in a lot of these big game parks in the drier areas. And birds like the go away bird just love to perch on top. It offers a real commanding view. Some of them were like tree size. I mean, bigger than like a saguaro you'd see in, in Arizona, really, really tall. and offered really good views for these guys. We saw several species of this particular kind of plant. So this was voted by me the most beautiful bird of the trip. Um, it's the lilac breasted roller. Um, they occur in thorn scrub as you can see here. And just this combination of colors with the blue, green, white, purple, um, just, just absolutely spectacular, just gorgeous birds. And they occur out in the open so they're really easy to see. And uh, it was a real treat. We stopped couple times for these guys to check them out and try to get some photographs. So now we're en route to the to the mountains, to the Varunga volcanoes where the gorillas occur. And uh, we stopped in a village to pick up some cash and some food and we had these pied crows. Um, really almost kind of raven size, they're really big, uh, really stocky and they occurred everywhere, especially in the lower elevations. They were all over the place. As we got higher in the mountains, there were white-necked ravens, which I wasn't able to get a photo of, but they kind of replaced the crows as we got higher up in the mountains. So the Albertine Rift, um, in Uganda, and also in some of the neighboring countries, um, there's this Albertine Rift, which is basically tectonic forces are driving the Somali plate away from the rest of the African plate. And all along this area here, including the valleys and the tops of the mountains here, um, it's called the Albertine Rift. And there's over 500 different kinds of plants and animals that are endemic just to this area. So um, there's tw actually 25 endemic Albertine Rift endemics in uh, Uganda. And we were lucky enough to see 23 of them. That's how good our guide was. I mean, these, these a lot of these guys are skulkers up in the high elevation forest in the mist and Crammy was spotting them like nobody's business. He was, he was really amazing. Here's one of the pictures of the Vrunga volcanoes. So the gorillas occur up here on the slopes. Um, the Vrunga volcanoes are uh, shared with Rwanda and the Democratic Republic of the Congo as well. So you can actually, um, 
go try to see the gorillas in Rwanda, which Catherine has done, um, and also Uganda. And I don't know if you can do it through the Democratic Republic of the Congo, but I wouldn't recommend it anyway. It's kind of unstable there still right now, I think. So Catherine's going to cringe because I know I'm going to butcher this. This is the Bowindi Impenetrable National Park. So I basically showed this slide to tell you the value of the gorillas to the, to the habitat in Uganda. All this forest is made possible because the gorillas are paying customers. If the gorillas weren't, if you didn't have to pay to go see the gorillas, guess what? It would all be this. It would all be cultivated like this. So um, because we had to buy a permit to see the gorillas, um, it's like 500, it was $500 a piece at the time. Um, that helps pay the locals to maintain this habitat. If that wasn't there, I don't think the habitat would be there either. So um, I think the locals have finally learned that it's good to keep the gorillas alive and actually try to increase their numbers because more and more tourists like us want to come see them and it puts more money into the local economy. So that's a very good thing. So one of the lodges we stayed at, we had this northern double colored sunbird. They're really iridescent and actually I should have I should have said this on the first slide of a sunbird. They actually are ecological equivalents of the hummingbirds. Um, they feed on nectar and even though they don't hover like hummingbirds, um, they still very much fill that same same niche in Africa. And there's there's so, every different color and shape in the rainbow that you can think of just like the hummingbirds. So it was really a treat to see these guys. So at this place called the Traveler's Rest, which is actually a spot that uh, Ernest Hemingway did a lot of his writing and a lot of his adventuring out of, um, they actually kept the old part of the hotel and then built around it. So actually the place where um, Hemingway stayed is still intact, it's pretty cool. So out in the garden, we came in late one afternoon, we walked around out back in the garden and we had just hundreds of these Angola fruit bats. It was really cool to see them. I'd always wanted to see a fruit bat. Um, they're really cute because unlike the insectivorous bats like the myotis and that sort of thing, the vespertilian bats. Um, these guys have really huge eyes because they're actually going after fruit. They're not really going after insects at all. So it was pretty neat. And uh, they squabble with each other and they fuss and they pile up, as you can see here, they pile up together, four or five together. You'd think that they'd spread out a little bit, but no, they're, <laughs> they're always fussing with each other, but it was really, really neat to see though. That's another one that I'd wanted to see. So this is the gorilla mist camp, and this is actually where Diane Fossey stayed when she was up here studying the mountain gorillas. Um, Kevin actually slid down these stairs, so I can tell you they're wet and slippery in the rain. <laughs> we, uh, we came here in, in, in the uh, aftermath of a, of a rainstorm, and it was pretty slick, and so I kind of bit it going down the stairs, but luckily I had my backpack on, so I just slid down on my backpack. So, but these bungalows were really neat. This is where we stayed. Um, it was cold and misty though, for sure. Um, you're up at high altitude here, you're above, above 6,000 feet, so. This is another member of the Bushrike family, it's called the Looters Bushrike, if I'm not butchering that one. Um, we shot this right off of the balcony where we had our meals at the, at the Gorilla Mist Camp. Um, really, really spectacular bird. A lot of these birds were skulkers and really difficult to see, but once you saw them, a lot of them were really ornate and had these really neat patterns and colors to them. So this is called the, uh, oh boy, I'll, I'm sure I'll get this one wrong too, the Ruwenzori three-horned chameleon. This is an endemic reptile to the Albertine Rift. And pretty much anything that has this name in front of it is an endemic to the Albertine Rift. That's what we learned when we were here. Um, again, this is one of those things I wanted to see. Since I was really little, I had a, I think it's called a Jackson's three-horned chameleon as a pet when I was uh, maybe 10 years old, something like that. So. I wanted to see one in the wild and it was kind of neat watching these guys. Not only do they have an interesting shape and then the eyes move all around independently, each eye moves independently. Um, as it moved along the vegetation, it changed colors to match the vegetation that it was crawling along. So that was really fun to see as well. We also saw several species of what are called tinker birds. And basically they're a smaller version of the old world barbettes. Um, we saw four or five different species and they were, they were pretty common. Um, they were not difficult to see. This is one of my favorite birds of the trip. It's actually, this looks like a mountain bluebird in some ways, but it's Af actually an African blue flycatcher. So 
this was right outside again one of the places that we stayed so it was really really fun to watch this guy there was actually a pair of them working in this hedgerow look at that little crest he's got there he was he was pretty excited here's another albertine rift endemic this is called the Rowanzori batis um, characterized by really short tails and this kind of black and white pattern they almost remind me of a if you've seen a, a toddy flycatcher in the New World, very much that same shape and, 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 and appearance. Here's another one that's kind of related to that. It's called the brown-throated wattle-eye. And this is what it's named for. This is the wattle above the eye here. So really cool little birds, about the size of a, uh, maybe a little bit bigger than a Hutton's Vireo. And very, very active, always flitting around from branch to branch. So this was neat. Um, in the place where we went to try to see the gorillas, um, we stopped near the entrance station and we had these western tree hyraxes. And you wouldn't know to look at them, but this is actually thought to be the closest living relative to the elephant, which when you look at them, you think, huh? <laughs> at least that's what I thought. But um, that's, that's what I understand. So one of the many species of primates we saw were these Lahos monkeys. Um, really, really pretty pattern. Um, we saw them in, in several of the forests that we went to, and uh, they spent a lot of time watching us, probably more time watching us than we were actually watching them. So here's the payoff. This is, we took this uh, trek from hell <laughs> to see the mountain gorillas. Um, as I said earlier, you pay $500 to get a permit. Um, you set up a time to go, to go see the gorillas. What happens is trackers follow these groups around during the day. They make note of where the gorillas, <coughs> excuse me, are spending the night. <clears throat> and then the next day when you go out to see them, uh, the trackers go out ahead of you and go to where the gorillas were spotted the night before, radio back to the rangers that are taking you out there. And uh, hopefully they'll, they'll stay there until you get to that location. Um, my understanding is from the guides, it takes five years to habituate these gorilla groups to humans. Um, and once we got there, they pretty much treated us just like part of the environment. They did not pay any attention at all. I don't think, I don't think there was any effort spent in even looking our way for any of these guys. So this is the big silverback. Um, the family group we went to had eight members. Uh, we probably saw, I think, six of those. A couple of them were probably further up the slope. And they spent most of their time just hanging out, eating, eating the vegetation. These guys are definitely vegetarians. So. Unlike the chimps, which can be a little scary, um, these guys are really, really gentle. They made a few vocalizations toward each other, uh, mostly I think for mom to try to keep the, the baby in line. But this was really cool. We actually got within five, eight feet of these guys. Catherine was actually um, sitting just down slope taking pictures of this guy and, and she was no more than eight feet away. Another cool thing that happened, and uh, this is something that Denise and I think Sonia will never forget. Um, one of the females worked its way back around um, behind our group, kind of walked around us, and then walked back through us to get up to the slope where the silverback was sitting. And as it came back through the group, it actually brushed against Denise's leg and I think against Sonia's leg as well. So that's definitely something they're never going to forget. That was really, really cool. So here's an adult female mountain gorilla. Um, my understanding is that probably almost half of the mountain gorillas that are left occur in this habitat where we were. Um, they are increasing slightly, or at least they were, like I said, because they're getting protected now and they're, 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 paying, they're paying now. Um, so the locals know that it's worthwhile to keep these guys alive, which is great. And there's Denise's favorite, the little guy, <laughs> Junior. <laughs> she was, she definitely, this is where the vocalizations happened. She was, she was calling down to him to try to keep him in line because he would kind of wander around, play a little bit, run back. So, So this is a short video clip that Denise took of the whole family. So the silverbacks up here, the adult female here, and then the little one is here. Um, you can see there's a tremendous amount of insect activity here. And uh, you can appreciate the fact that these guys have really thick coats to try to combat that. And another reason they have the really thick coats is it's darn cold up here, cold and high elevation. Um, in fact, I wasn't sure I was going to make it out of here, to be honest. It was, I got wet, I got dehydrated, and uh, my legs kind of gave out of me. So without our porters, and here's 
kudos to the porters. Um, I personally, I don't think I would have come out of there without the porter. And I thought I was in pretty good shape coming in, but hiking up and down those slick hills, what happens is you start off at a high elevation, you go down a steep slope, you cross a creek, you come up another steep slope to where the gorillas are, and then you have to repeat. And it was a long hike, a long slippery hike. It had just rained. Um, so it was really, really slippery too. But I would, I would, despite all that, I would highly recommend it. This is like one of the best things that's ever happened to me in my life. Going to see the mountain gorillas is, is definitely a must do. So if you get any opportunity at all, please, please do it. Uh -oh. Where's the rest? So another bird that we were trying to see, this is a, not a great picture, but I put it in here because this bird is very, very difficult to see. And we took another brutal hike the day after the gorilla hike. I think our guide was trying to break us in, <laughs> get these out of the way before we went much further. But uh, I think we actually hiked a little bit further to see these guys. And this is a tiny little bird called a Grower's Broadbill. Um, again, an Albertine Rift endemic. It hangs around these wet areas um, known as the Mbwindi Swamp. Um, and it's this little tiny green bird that occurs way up high in the trees. And we came upon it as this other group was, was um, watching them as well. And I was just so happy to see this bird. I thought, if I go all this way and I don't see this bird, oh. <laughs> so luckily our guides are really good. So we didn't miss out on too many of the endemics. So here's a look at a nice clear stream. This is sort of the habitat you got a little bit lower down in Buwindi Impenetrable National Park. So we stopped at several locations in this national park because it's huge and it's got different habitat types as you go up and down the mountains. And uh, of course that leads to different diversity of birds as well. So here's another roller that occurs up in that higher elevation habitat, a blue-throated roller. You saw bar-tailed trogon. Um, I believe these are in a different family than the ones that occur in the New World. So. This reminds me a lot of a, or what's, I'm trying to think of that trogon that's in the new world. Hmm. Maybe more of a mass trogon, except for maybe the tail, it doesn't have the lattice like this, but it's about the same size as the mass trogon that would be in the new world. So then we went to one of my favorite places on the whole trip, um, outside of the gorillas. I think I enjoyed this place the most because the weather was pretty good. You have these wide open vistas like this, um, lots and lots of variety. In fact, Queen Elizabeth National Park has the highest bird diversity of any park in Uganda. It has over 600 recorded species so far. Um, lots of different kind of mammals, lots of different kind of herbs. So this was really a neat place. And there were a lot of, lot of photo ops, which was nice. A lot of times, I should say this, when we went on, we were in a bus and in these areas where there's big predators like lions and leopards occur, um, you're, not out, you're not able to get out of the bus in those areas. So you're trying to shoot pictures outside the bus windows and made it kind of tough on photography sometimes. We pretty much saw everything pretty well, but in terms of getting photos, if you can imagine eight people trying to jockey for position with your giant telephoto lenses, it made it kind of challenging sometimes. So kudos to the group for making it work as well as it did because it could have been, could have been a lot harder. So look at the nice little baboon. <laughs> they look nice until they yawn like this and open their mouths. And this is a big male and check out those teeth. These are definitely fearsome, fearsome animals. Um, they occur in large groups. We saw them in a lot of different locations. Um, and they're definitely, they kind of rule the roost where they are. I think the only thing that really messes with them is leopards once in a while. But even then, I think a leopard would be hard pressed to take on a, an adult male baboon. They are really aggressive, really fierce. Unfortunately, in some of the places we went to, they're kind of habituated to humans. So they raid the garbage bins and sometimes right right where you are, where we went to Kabali, which I'll talk about later. And we're sitting on the porch after we, we saw our chimpanzees and this baboon just runs up. I mean, it seemed like a blur within seconds and it opened a trash can, pulled the stuff out and taken off back down the lawn again. So that's, that's one of the bad aspects. They become a little bit too used to humans in that way. But it was kind of fun to see the large groups of them move around and watch the social interactions. This is a bird called a speckled mouse bird. And you can see this really long tail here and the nice crest, um, red, red feet here. They occurred in a lot of the thorn scrub habitat. There were actually a couple different species we were able to see. This is the Defasa waterbuck. Um, really beautiful coat and really ornate horns on these guys. So 
seeing the antelope was just such a treat. So many different kinds, so many different habitat types they, they, they occurred in and different behaviors as well. Some of them occurred in big groups, some in very small groups, um, but always a treat. And then they, they were pretty used to people because a lot of times when we were driving along the tracks, they would just be sitting right, wouldn't even move. So that was kind of neat. This is a species we saw in several different locations. It's called the white-browed robin chat. Um, really, really pretty bird here. It almost reminds me a lot of a spindalis that you might see in the, in the New World. But we did see these in, in several different spots. There were some different robin chats, which are much more difficult to photograph that occurred in the forested areas and in the, in the dark undergrowth. Um, didn't really get any photos of those worth showing you guys, but this was one of the common ones and they were really pretty and occurred in a lot of different places. So this is the Varox's eagle owl, and this is in the same genus as the great horned owl. So it's a bubo. And one of the characteristics of this guy is, and that's the reason I took a picture of it specifically to get its eyes closed. These pink eyelids are really diagnostic of these guys. And you can see it at a long distance. Um, we saw them a couple different times on day roosts, and this is a really big owl. It's at least as big, probably a little bit bigger than a great horned owl. So look at the talons there. So this is one of the birds we saw almost everywhere we went. It's called the African Pied Wagtail. And it was actually so bold. This is, I got this picture on the dock of one of the um, boat trips that we took, Queen Elizabeth National Park. And you can see it's gathering nest material here. And it would walk, we had lunch there in the dining area and this guy would just walk right in and pick stuff off the floor and bring it back to his nest. It's pretty, pretty brave and pretty used to people. So this is another one of the animals I really, really wanted to see on this trip. I've always been fascinated by elephants. Um, they're so social, they're so smart, they're so big and they do really cool stuff. So you might think these two are fighting, but they're not at all. They're actually, this is a greeting. They're greeting each other with their trunks. And uh, we saw a lot of this throughout, throughout the trip. Um, I, there's just something, there's just something about the elephants. I mean, I could have watched them again and again and again and again. So this bird's called the collared Pratt and Cull. Um, I guess it's sort of a cross between a shorebird and a dove, if that makes any sense. Um, they occur on these really open habitats. Um, actually, they actually seem like they they act a lot like a killdeer. So, but I, I, I think they're in their own family, the Pratt and Culls. Another one of my favorite animals from the trip, the warthog. Um, what's really interesting about this is this is a very characteristic feeding behavior. They get down on their knees, I guess, because it's too hard if they're standing straight up to get that massive head down. And uh, this is how most of them ate. And in fact, um, I'm thinking it might be an innate behavior because we saw a bunch of little ones, little piglets, and uh, they were doing the same thing. I mean, they didn't, they didn't hesitate. They went right down to the knees. So I guess that's a, a behavior that's strongly ingrained in them. These tusks here are pretty formidable. They might look like they're not much, but uh, when some of these males would, this is actually a female, I think, when some of the males would, would come, and run, come running at you, you'd see these huge tusks and they definitely, uh, that's, that's, that's a business end that you wouldn't want to mess with. Um, one of the things I learned about warthogs on this trip, they actually, um, they have these dens or, or big burrows. And what they do is they back into them because guess what's facing anything that might come at them? This formidable face with these tusks. Um, it wouldn't make much sense to, to go the other way. So that's, that's one way they help protect themselves. We also saw several species of lapwing. Um, this is a crowned lapwing. So many beautiful lapwings. Um, again, mostly in open, open habitats. Um, really more actually in the open habitats than, than near that that very close to water. You maybe would expect to right on the shore, but we had a few on the shore, but a lot of them were in these open habitats like this. So here's the weaver nest I was talking about. So this one's the lesser wax, lesser masked weaver, sorry. And here's, here's one working on the nest. Look how ornate these nests are and how large. And they'll nest in very large colonies. Um, sometimes the colonies were mixed species. So you'd see three or four different species and maybe in the same colony. Um, we witnessed this in several of the parks at Lake Victoria um, in Tebby Botanical Gardens. Um, really, really fun birds to watch. Very active. 
So this is a picture of Roger and Greta at the Bush Lodge in Queen Elizabeth National Park. And I'm showing that because Denise and I stayed in a similar bungalow just down the way from them. And what happened was the first night we were there, um, I heard some rustling around just outside our porch. And I went out with my flashlight and lo and behold, there was a hippo about 50 yards away from our porch. So that was a little unnerving, <laughs> say the least. So that was, that was in the dark. And uh, the next night we came back to our bungalow and after dark, you always have one of the staff that comes along with you with the flashlight because of all the, it's all open. yeah, it's all open. There's predators around, there's hyenas, there's all sorts of things. So they have to be careful and then we'll lose a guest. So this guy's bringing his flashlight around and right in the walkway to our bungalow is another hippo. So we had to take a detour around and come in through the backside to, so that we could get to our, get to our bungalow. So it, it was pretty impressive to see him out at night. I mean, they are, they are really huge. In fact, here's my before and after shot. This is before sunscreen. This is after sunscreen. So actually these are, these are two different individuals. Um, again, we saw this out during the daytime, which is unusual. This one had just gone into a mud wallow and covered itself. And what this does is protects it from the sun, but it also protects it from parasites and biting insects. So when they're out during the day, they really need to protect themselves because this, this can get scorched pretty easily. So this is one of my top five birds of the whole trip. This is called the Malachite Kingfisher. And uh, you can see the colors and the pattern. It's about the size of a green kingfisher, but Luckily for us, this being such a beautiful bird, we saw it pretty much every large lake and river that we went to. Um, and they were, they were just so fun to watch, so active, so beautiful, um, hunting for minnows on the water's edge, really, really neat to see. So here's a Nile crocodile, and you can see some African skimmers in the background. Um, a lot of times they'll rest with their mouth open like that. And my understanding from our guide is that most of the ones in Queen Elizabeth and most of the areas that we went to feed on fish. So all those films you see where they're grabbing wildebeest or they're grabbing something else and yanking into the water, that doesn't happen here. Pretty much there's so many fish that they don't have to, to mess with the large mammals at all. So Nile crocodiles are the second largest crocodile species in the world, I think behind the saltwater croc in Australia. Um, the big males can get to be up to 12 feet long and weigh up to 1,500 pounds, if you can imagine that. So almost a ton of crocodile. That's, that's pretty scary. <laughs> so Africa has their own spoonbills. This is an African spoonbill with the pink legs and red facial skin and all white. Um, we saw a nice flock of these at Queen Elizabeth. This is another big herp. This is called the Nile monitor lizard. And these guys can get five to six feet long and weigh up to 15 to 20 pounds. So that's another really, really big lizard. Um, when I first saw one, of course, my mind went to the, all those shows you see about the Komodo dragons and they're, they're really huge, but uh, the, this is a really, really big lizard. So, and a lot of times they hung out, literally hung out like this. So if you can see, there's the snout, there's the tip of the tail way up here. So this is, this is a big one. This is probably close to five feet right here. So this was one of the birds we saw in, in and around civilization quite a bit. In fact, this was taken in a little village we went to, uh, the Marabou Stork. Um, unfortunately, they hang out around garbage dumps a lot. So when you go to the uh, garbage dumps in these cities, you'll see big flocks of Marabou Storks hanging out there. So habitat, not, so, not quite so great, but they are impressive. This is a, this is a really big bird. It's bigger than uh, like a wood stork. It's about one and a half times the size of a wood stork. So it's, it's a big bird. This is another species of kingfisher we saw called the pied kingfisher um, for obvious reasons by the pattern here. And this is what they do. They do a lot of the hovering just like our kingfishers do. So the interesting thing about Africa though is we saw probably as many kingfishers not associated with water like in the forest and uh, forest edge as we did in the water. So there's a lot of what they call woodland quote unquote woodland kingfishers in Africa. So they're not really associated with water at all. So that was, that was really interesting to me. I thought that all kingfishers might be associated with water, but that's just not the case. So here's another lapwing called the Senegal lapwing. Um, very different pattern as you can see, but all of them are just really dainty, um, 
kind of remind you of plovers. Really, 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 really pretty birds. So as a former graduate student of UC Davis, um, I was really, really excited to see Uganda Cobbs. Um, they replaced the Impala in Queen Elizabeth National Park. And the males had this behavior during the breeding season called lecking. So they stake out their territory in the short grass or a bare patch of ground with comparatively long grass. And they compete for these territories. And the males that are able to sequester the central territories in this cluster of, of territories, they're the ones that get the preferential mating from the females. The female will walk around through the leks and uh, she'll preferentially mate with the male that has the, occupies the central position um, of the leks. So we actually got to see these guys battling it out pretty good. Unfortunately, most of the really nice battles were pretty far away from our vehicle. So we couldn't get any good, at least I didn't get any good footage of it, but it was fun to watch. I mean, we actually read several papers about this when I was in graduate school. So it was pretty cool to see the guys in action that I'd read about. So this is one of the many incredible stork species in Africa. This is the yellow-billed stork. Um, this is one of the more common species. We saw it in several areas. Um, we actually saw a couple of nests as in a village that we went through in town. So pretty, pretty neat birds. I love, I just love the contrast with the red and the yellow there and then the pinkish on the legs. So you recognize this bird, it's a stilt, but this is a black wing stilt instead of our stilt, but pretty much the same size and behavior. So I have to apologize for this slide. This is my life lion, can you believe it? <laughs> Laying on its back, it just had tackled an antelope. There was a fresh kill over here and the belly was full. It was basically snoozing. Um, as you can see in the picture, it had pretty high insect load, unfortunately. And also there were lots of gashes on it. In fact, I thought that it was dead when we first pulled up to it, but we watched it for about 10 minutes. And finally, after five, six, seven minutes even, it finally rolled over, yawned a little bit and then rolled back onto its back. So it's a young male. Um, it definitely either had a battle with another lion or had a very difficult time in tackling the prey item that it killed because it was really hurt. And there was all sorts of open wounds on it. So, but this is my life lion. So I had to show it. So here's another one of the Taracos. This is a great blue Taraco. And we saw this in lots of different places and it was just this gorgeous, spectacular bird. You see this giant blue thing flying across these openings to get to these fruiting, fruiting plants. Really, really neat to see these guys. And yet another lapwing, the spurwing lapwing. These guys are actively calling, calling, calling. They're carving out their territories and, and battling it out when we saw them here. This is a red-tailed monkey from Queen Elizabeth National Park. You can see why it was named there, the long tail with some reddish at the end hanging down there. I think it's really interesting, the nose here. I guess, my guess is that this would enable you to see, see each other um, in the dark forest because this white nose should, it's almost like a headlight, right? So. So then it was on to Kabali Forest. And Kabali Forest National Park has the highest diversity of primates of any park in Africa, I believe. Um, there's 13 species, I believe, that are possible. And I think we saw 10 or 11 of those. So we were very, very fortunate. It's a neat, really neat spot. This is our, I had to show this because this is our favorite lodge that we stayed at. It's called the Chimpanzee, um, Chimpanzee View Guest House. And it's literally right down the road from the, from the Kabali National Park. Um, the bungalows were situated far apart and in really neat little areas. You had all these gardens around. So there were lots of birds. Um, the food was really good. Uh, they had this great patio where we ate some of our meals and with a nice, beautiful deck with a commanding view. So this was, I think the group thought that this was probably our favorite place that we stayed of any of the places on our trip. That's the other thing I should say. If you do want to organize a trip through avian safaris, um, He's very, very willing to be flexible and negotiate on price. Um, at first he wanted to book us into a bunch of four and five star lodges, but I said, no. <laughs> so what he ended up doing, and we went back and forth for about six months is we came up with a combination of kind of Spartan places to stay, really nice places to stay, kind of in between places to stay. Um, 
So it worked out really well. I ended up carving off about $2,000 per person by negotiating with him on the, on the accommodations. Um, honestly, on these trips, you're not in your, in your hotel or lodge room that long anyway. So as long as there's a decent place to sleep and, and a shower, that's pretty much what we were looking for. So in fact, this one place, this one place was so cold that they provided hot water bottles in the beds. So you could, you could snuggle up on and with one of those. Yeah, that was at the, the Miss Camp, Gorilla Miss Camp. So we didn't have any place I thought that was really bad. Um, I know Roger and Greta had to move one time uh, at one place, but in general, I think Crammy did a really good job of, of providing um, accommodations for us. So here's two endemic monkeys that occur in Uganda, the Uganda Mangabe and the Uganda Red Colobus Monkey. And we saw both of these in Kabali. Here's another one of the tinkerbirds. This is the yellow-throated tinkerbird. And here's what we mostly came to Kabali for. You can trek what they call trekking for chimpanzees. Um, it's not quite as expensive as the gorillas, but you do spend, I think it's like 100 to $200 per person for a permit. And you go into this orientation in the headquarters and then they take you out in the forest um, to try to find these habituated groups of chimpanzees. Um, luckily for us, especially after the gorilla, which, which almost killed me, <laughs> we saw these guys probably a hundred yards from the headquarters. We got really, really lucky. Somebody spotted this, this guy up in the tree eating the fruit. So we were able to watch it for, for quite a long time. Um, we actually saw another couple of chimpanzees on the ground here when we were looking for other things in the forest. So, um, it's amazing how quietly they can move through the forest. I mean, these guys aren't, this is not a small animal. Um, but they, they can move very quickly, very stealthily through the forest. So you definitely need to be aware. Um, unlike the gorillas, these guys, um, maybe not the habituated ones so much, but if you run into a group that's not, um, they're very aggressive. Chimpanzees actually hunt other primates. So it's not like they're just sitting there eating fruit all the time like, like this fellow here. Um, a lot of times they're actively hunting other animals. So, and they also have a lot of aggression towards neighboring groups. I mean, they're always getting into battles from what we hear from the guides, so. So this is one of the larger barbet species, the double-toothed barbet, which was seen right from our bungalow. Really, really pretty birds. A lot of the barbets in Africa have these combinations of red and black. We also saw this bird called the red-billed firefinch. Um, you see a lot of these types of birds in pet stores. And here was a really interesting weaver. It's all black in plumage. Most of the, weave, almost all the other weavers we saw in Africa had a combination of yellow, black, and orange. Um, but this guy was, was completely black with his yellow eye. And here he is working on his, his or her nest right there. So this bird is like one of the holy grail birds of, Af of uh, Uganda, the green-breasted pitta. Um, it's very, very difficult to see. Um, when you do see them, it's usually pre-dawn, so you don't get great looks. Um, they display literally probably about an hour before decent light hits the forest. Um, we earned this bird. We went after for we went for it two mornings. The first morning, it rained like heck on us, and we got just soaked <laughs> and no bird. So some of our group stayed behind the next morning, but the rest of us went out and got it the next morning. The guides picked it off by its display on the forest floor. And they literally grabbed us by our hands and pulled each one of us so that we get decent decent looks at these guys. So I was just happy to get any picture of them. And look, look how beautiful they are. This pattern and these colors is just, just a spectacular bird. Reminds you a lot of the ant pittas of the new world. Um, they occupy very much a similar niche and just, just, just a spectacular bird. And I think Kabali Forest is by far the best place to try to get it, but we definitely felt like we earned this one. So now we're heading over to Similiki Forest. Um, purportedly, it has a lot of species that you don't see elsewhere. Um, this was like one of our, oh, I don't know what to say, I don't want to say least favorite, but had the least amount of birds for us for whatever reason, there just wasn't a lot, of, a lot going on there. Um, you can get different species of hornbills, um, different species of kingfishers, but we just didn't see that much. And it just recently rained, so it was really muddy and kind of hard to walk through the environment, but it was pretty nice forest and 
we actually came upon this hot spring, which was really cool too. I didn't expect that in the middle of the, or the edge of the forest there. So it reminded me a lot of something you might see at Lassen Volcano National Park or something like that. So this is one of my favorite birds of the trip. This is the image, this is a immature crown eagle and crown eagles occupy the same niche as a harpy eagle in the rainforest of, um, of Uganda. They're big crested eagles. They have huge talons. Um, they actively hunt primates. So they'll pick monkeys off as they're flying along in the forest. Um, so it was really a treat to see them. We actually had one cruise right over us in one of the places we stopped and we, I actually ducked because the, sh the shadow was so big. But uh, yeah, they're very, very impressive. Kind of a unique bird that we saw on the trip, the palm nut vulture. Um, everybody always associates vultures with eating carrion, right? But these guys really predominantly eat palm nuts. That's really what they eat. They don't really eat much carrion at all. And probably because of that, they have much more feathering around the head and face than most other vultures that you would see. So, cause they're not competing at carcasses like the other vultures. We saw several shrike species there. Um, this is a Northern Fiskal. Uh, at our lunch spot, this guy was coming to the ground, grabbing insects um, in this veranda right next to us. So I couldn't resist trying to get a picture of him. We also birded this spot called the Royal Mile. And the reason it's called that is because um, the, I'm gonna have trouble pronouncing this, Nuyen Yoro Kingdom had designated this as a sacred area. So in pre-colonial times, this was a hunting ground just for this, this one particular kingdom. Um, the birding is really, really good. You literally just follow this road for a mile and follow it for a mile back. And there's all sorts of um, neat birds along the edges here, as well as chimpanzees. We actually saw some chimpanzees too. So this is another hornbill species that we saw on our way to Murchison Falls National Park. This is an African gray hornbill. So there's some really, really big species of hornbill. And there's also some, um, this is like one of the smaller species of hornbill, but some of them have these huge casts and I'll, I'll get to those in just a little bit here. So this is one of the cooler birds on the trip, the Northern Red Bishop, just incredibly beautiful. It's like a, somebody turn on the lights when they pop into a bush, these males are just so brightly colored. Really, really spectacular. So here we are at Murchison Falls National Park. So this is the oldest and largest national park in, uh, in Uganda. And here's the Nile River right here. This is a view from our lodge. So this is how we had to get over to where we stayed at Murchison Falls. We had to take this ferry across the river. Really, really interesting, very, very slow ferry. And as you can see, there's not a lot of room. So sometimes you just had to wait um, so you can get your, get your spot on the ferry. So this is where we stayed. It's called the Para Safari Lodge. And this is another view from our porch down here. Um, unfortunately, I had a video, but unfortunately I wasn't able to, to load it onto the slideshow. But the very first night we were here, we'd just been birding all day. We came and took our showers. We walked out and looked out our window and there was an elephant right here foraging on the garden. And it stayed for a good 10 or, 10 or 15 minutes as it worked its way down um, the slope. So that's in Africa, you're really close to some of this stuff. So that's, that's just so neat. Um, there was another place we stayed where we heard hyenas at night. And I thought, wow, that's, that's pretty cool. So I have to go back because I really want to hear the, the lions roaring at night. That's something we, we didn't get to experience, but I'd really like to do that. I think that'd be cool. <laughs> So here's Murchison Falls itself. Um, you can see the, the power of the river as it's coming into this gorge. This gorge is only about eight meters across and it drops 141 feet from here. So we took boat trips in this location, both below the falls and above the falls. So it was kind of kind of neat to get the perspective from both sides. This is one of the boats we took our boat trip on. And I have to give kudos, this is Paul, our driver. He was our driver the whole trip. He was fantastic. He got that vehicle in spots that I would have never even tried. <laughs> he was very, very impressive. So, but this is the sort of thing you take these motorized boats with the covers so you don't fry because the sun's pretty strong. And uh, you cruise up and down looking for things along the edge of the river and in the water. 
Yeah, and this is one of the birds you can get there. This is a dark chanting goshawk. And this is a marsh chagra calling, calling, calling. Another raptor we saw, the banded snake eagle. We ended up seeing, I think, four different species of snake eagle on the trip. So again, the raptor diversity is unbelievable. It's worth it just for the raptors. If, if you're into that, it's, it's just amazing. These are called Eastern plantain eaters. So this, this shot was taken from about God, I don't even know, <laughs> three or 400 yards at least away. We're in, we're in our bus up on this hill, looking down into this tree. And these are the famous tree climbing lions of the Ashasha sector of Murchison Falls National Park. Um, apparently lions don't climb trees in very many areas, but the groups here have learned to do that. So you'll often see the groups of the prides, and this is the female here, prides literally hanging out in the trees. Um, especially during the heat of the day and after they've had a big meal. So it was kind of cool to see them. Even though it was at a distance, it was still kind of fun to... Scope, scope view was pretty good. <laughs> so we also saw giraffes. This is one of Denise's favorite animals from the trip. Saw them in several locations. Um, these two are engaging in what's called necking. And no, it's not amorous. This is actually an aggressive behavior. The males are sizing each other up and when it gets time for, for breeding season, they'll actually throw their necks at each other and throw their heads at each other and just smack it with, with pretty incredible force from what I understand. So this was not one of those hyper aggressive situations, but they were definitely checking each other out and uh, preparing for that, that in the future. And apparently this only happens with um, herds of males. So they're always testing each other to see who's gonna be most dominant, always check, always testing. So this is in my top 10. This is a Marshall Eagle. And I told you the crowned eagle is the harpy eagle of the forest in Africa. Well, the Marshall Eagle is the harpy eagle of the plains. They actually not only hunt primates, but they've been known to take small antelope. So if you can imagine, check out the talons on this guy. They're absolutely incredible. And he's got a crest, which they raise when they're alarmed. And very, very impressive, very impressive eagle. Probably the most impressive um, raptor we had on the trip. So at Murchison Falls, we also had these monkeys called the Patas monkey. And this is one of the few terrestrial monkeys in Uganda. Most of them are in, up in the forest. Um, but these guys are out on the plains. It's pretty interesting. We also saw these birds called the Payapayak. And they're actually related to corvids, as you might imagine. But look at the length of this tail here. Really long pointed tail. Um, and sometimes groups of these will do the same thing that the oxpecker was doing. They'll alight on the back of a large mammal and pick parasites off or stay on the back of the animal until they kick something up interesting and then go down after the insect or whatever else the uh, ungulates have dug up for them. This is one of the more common starlings we saw on the trip. It's the Rupel starling. And again, um, I have to say it's a lot prettier than ours. <laughs> so. This was kind of cool. This is on the grounds of one of the, of the lodges we stayed at at Murchison Falls. We also saw giant kingfishers, which if you birded much in the new world, these, these guys were actually larger than a ringed kingfisher. So really, really large birds. This is the only place we saw them and uh, it was really fun. We saw a couple different pairs as we went along the edges of the, of the river. This is the National Bird of Uganda. These are gray crowned cranes. Um, we saw them in several locations. This was interesting because they were at the top of a tree, which maybe you don't necessarily expect a crane to be at. Um, yeah, they, they were really, really pretty, really easy to see and not, not too afraid of people either, which is kind of nice. Here's another one of the top 10 birds. This is called an Abyssinian ground hornbill. And uh, th these birds are huge and they're totally terrestrial. Um, we saw them walking around the plains looking for, looking for food. Um, they'll eat lizards, uh, snakes, uh, pretty much anything they can tackle. And this is a really big bird. This is the biggest, I think this is the largest hornbill, yeah, that we saw on the trip. A um, couple feet high, a couple feet long, and these huge casks, really, really neat, and these throat pouches as well. 
I'd only seen these in zoos before. So it's kind of a lot of these animals I'd only seen in zoos before. So it was really cool to see them in real life. So this is right behind the uh, roller for me in terms of beauty of the birds we saw. This is a red throated bee eater. And what happened is we were cruising along the river and we saw this huge colony of these guys. And they, they what they do is they nest in holes in the bank. So it almost looks like what would here if you had like a bank, a big bank swallow colony, right? It looks a lot like that with those holes close together in a cut bank. And that's where these guys nest. We also saw these birds called a Denham's bustard. Uh, looks a little bit like an ostrich, I suppose, but definitely smaller than that. Um, but actually one of the largest terrestrial birds that we saw on the trip. So pretty, pretty stocky. This was along the margins of the, of the lake. So this is another candidate for one of the most beautiful birds in the world, I think. The northern carmine bee eater, um, even though it was very overcast and very gray the day that we saw these, um, when they flew in, it was amazing. Um, we, we drove by the location at first. Our guide said, ah, they're not here right now. They'll be here about 10 o'clock. And we're going, oh, yeah, right, 10 o'clock. You know this exactly. So we went around and did some other birding and came back. Three till 10, boom, the first one flies in, then another, then another. So. That's another example of how amazing our guide had all these things dialed in. I mean, he, he was he was incredible. So this is a side striped jackal. We saw three or four of these around. The, it might have been the same kill as the, the lion that I showed earlier. Um, you can see he's definitely been checking out some food. He's got blood on his face and his legs. And um, what they do is they kind of stay on the edge and wait until the lion's had its fill. And then they race in and try to get as much as they can before the lion's aware of them. Um, the lion that I showed you probably wasn't aware of much. <laughs> it was just snoozing. So these guys probably got a lot of food out of that. These are really neat birds. Um, rock pratincoles. They occurred on the boulders um, in the Nile River just before we got to the falls at Murchison Falls. Yeah, and they acted a lot like terns, but it was interesting that they hung out on the on the rocks, literally. Um, really beautiful bird. We actually pulled up um, 10 feet away from these guys at the most, and the boat stopped right there. We couldn't go any further because then we'd be, we'd be heading down the falls, but he kind of moored on these rocks just below these birds, so we all got really good photos, so it was really fun to, to watch these guys. This is my favorite stork from the trip, the saddle build stork. Check out the colors and pattern on the face here. Just amazing, absolutely beautiful. So, and of course I had to show more bush elephants. I couldn't help myself. We also were in forest where we um, found dung of the forest elephant, but we never really actually saw any of those. Um, you can see these elephants have gotten a lot of red dirt on them and I think we all came back from the trip with a lot of red dirt on us, on our shoes and our clothes. Um, it's pretty prevalent there. This one on the right here is doing a mock charge. It kind of runs up to a certain distance and then holds up and then runs up to a certain distance and holds up. So it never really threatened our vehicle, but it was doing these kind of, hey, keep your distance, stay back, I'm here kind of thing. So here we are getting towards the end of the trip. We, we had arranged for us to go see the rhinoceroses at the Ziwa Rhino Sanctuary. Um, what they've done is the white rhino is actually extirpated in Uganda, but what they've done is they created this preserve and they've imported rhinos from different parts of, the, of Africa. And they've actually built up a, a herd of about 22 now in this spot. And the cool thing about this is the rangers actually spend almost all their time with the rhinos. The poacher, poachers are so bad after the rhino horns that the rangers have to stay with the herds almost constantly to make sure that they're not being threatened by poachers. So kudos and all respect to those guys that are hanging out with the rhinos 24 seven. Um, again, it's a lot like the gorillas. You pay your money for the permit, the trackers figure out where the rhinos are the day before or maybe just before you get there even. And then they radio to the guy who's take, actually walking you out to him and we actually were able to track these guys on foot, which was really, really cool. So before that, on the entrance row, we saw this little antelope called a diker. Really, really small. It's a forest antelope, and they're not really easy to see. So even though it's obscured a little bit, I had to show it because it's just so, so neat to actually be able to see one. You can see it's got these little tiny horns. 
they're very shy. They usually stay inside the forest. They don't really come out very often, but this guy was kind of just laying down in this, in this long vegetation. And this is what we came for, the white rhinoceros. Um, these guys are just like, I would characterize them as giant lawnmowers. When we were watching them go through the environment. Um, I think we had a total of seven. So we had a lot of the, like almost a third of the ones that are in the park. And uh, they would move along together and just mow the grass. Literally, they would eat the grass as they're moving along and they move in a big group. So it looked like, looked like a giant lawnmower going along, um, eating the grass in the, in the environment there. So we saw a mother with the calf, but unfortunately they were kind of obscured. So I didn't get a good picture of that, but we, we were watching the rhinos for a good hour. Yeah, half an hour to an hour. So that was really neat. So here we are back at the Entebbe Botanical Gardens. There's Roger Marlowe, just for size comparison. Look at this termite mound. It's just huge. I just had to show that's one of the biggest ones that we saw on the trip. It's pretty amazing. So back at the Botanical Gardens, they have a lot of raptors there as well. This is an African Harrier Hawk, also known as the Gymnogene. Um, as you might imagine, it's uh, very much like and probably pretty closely related to the Caracaras. You see this red facial skin here, really, really pretty. There's also woodland kingfishers. Um, this is interesting. They called it a woodland kingfisher, and we saw it in a lot of dryland habitats. But here it is on the edge of Lake Victoria, so this has a pretty, pretty wide niche, I think. But the kingfisher diversity on this trip was amazing. We ended up seeing six or eight different species, so that was really neat. And all very colorful, except for the pied, all very colorful. Um, some of them were really skulky in the forest, like the African dwarf kingfisher and the African pygmy kingfisher. Really hard to see. Really tiny up in the dark forest. But um, we ended up getting good scope looks at just about all of these. So that was neat. So we saw this African open bill, uh, another type of stork at the Entebbe Botanical Gardens. And you can see why it's called the open bill. It has this gap between the upper and lower mandible here. This is another one of the larger hornbill species that we saw, the black and white cask hornbills. Um, this is the cask right here. So this is the male, this is the female. Um, we saw these in, gosh, a lot more places than I thought we were going to. Um, eating fruit, noisily flying over the canopy. Uh, again, it's, it's a pretty large bird. These, are, these guys are a couple feet long. So very impressive, very impressive birds. And here's a tantalus monkey, um, one of the primates you can pick up at the botanical gardens. These guys are totally unafraid of people. And so you really have to watch it <laughs> steal your lunch in a heartbeat, I think. So this is probably the most common raptor we saw on the trip, the black kites. We saw them just about everywhere. Um, really impressive. We actually saw a group up in the mountains that were, according to our guide, kind of migrating through. And they're probably, it's just like you'd see kettles of broad wings or swainsons here. Uh, there are probably several dozen birds in that flock. That was kind of neat. So there are all sorts of habitat types, lowlands, mountains, they're, just, they're all over. Um, this was formerly considered a separate species and some experts still considered that yellow-billed kite as opposed to um, the nominate species or the nominate subspecies, I guess, that has a, a black bill. So we were able to see African gray parrots at Lake Victoria View Guest House. The last time we stayed at Lake Victoria View Guest House at the beginning and the end of the trip. So we were able to see um, African gray parrots there at the end. Um, these guys can live to be a long, long time. I don't know if all of you or any of you remember this, but African gray parrot was owned by Winston Churchill and actually outlived him. Um, I don't know who it went to after he passed, but I think these guys can live up to be 75, 80 years old, which is, which is pretty amazing. This is a female slender billed weaver, another of the weaver species we saw at Lake Victoria View Guest House. This is for Catherine Lawrence. This is the common bulbul. <laughs> this is the only bird we saw every, every day. single day of our trip. So no matter what habitat we were in, no matter what elevation, we saw a common bulbul. So I had to see that, had to show that since it was the most common bird on the trip. And finally, you have to show a sunset shot, right? To end the slideshow. So this is a sunset at Lake Maburo National Park. And that's it. Thank you all so much for coming and sharing this 
adventure with us. So well, thank you, Kevin. Uh, folks, I forgot to mention that um, if you have questions, put them in the in the chat and we'll read them off to Kevin. Um, there were a few questions in there, I think. Catherine did answer one about what month you went, and she said it was July. Yes. In 2019. And let's see. And uh, someone wanted to know what the con could you repeat the connection between the COP and UCD? You mentioned that you you were a grad student. Yes, we read several papers when I was in graduate school, Ken, about the Uganda COP and their social system. Um, because I, I got my master's in behavioral ecology, and so this was one of the um, research papers we read was about the Uganda COB and how they set up their their social system. Okay, so there. Okay, someone had asked, what area is included in the old world? Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> Isn't it everything east of Massachusetts? <laughs> So that would include Europe, Africa, Australia, Russia. That's I think pretty I much thought. everything on the other everything on the other side of the Atlantic pretty much is what my understanding is. Yeah. Okay. Uh, wonderful. You got thank yous. Wonderful photos, Kevin. Uh, uh, let's see. What guidebook did you use? It's a bird called um, Birds of Africa South of the Sahara. Birds of okay. Africa, south of the Sahara. Okay. Uh, no, there it is. Birds of. Hang on, just a second. Oh, oh, here we go. Yes, it's called Birds of Africa, south of the Sahara. Okay. Uh, you, you had mentioned about that that uh, cactus-like plant not being a cactus, and a couple of people, right. and one of them being Glenn. Uh, uh -oh. said it is a euphorbia. Euphorbia, it's kind of like the, the bird euphorbia. Yes. <laughs> there are many species that look like cactus in Africa. Yeah, Glenn right. and jo Joelle and that, that mentioned that. that. Uh, yeah, it's actually, and, it's actually a succulent, yeah. Yeah, there, I'm sorry to have to tell you this, but you know, we're equal opportunity questions. A heckler said, no green, no, no green bull pictures included in your slideshow, Kevin. <laughs> I don't want to that give was that purposeful. person publicity. <laughs> That's okay. That, that was purposeful because um, they were very, very difficult to photograph and usually high up in the trees and moving around like crazy. Oh. So honestly, I think I maybe only got a couple of crappy pictures of a few of them. So I uh -huh. thought, eh. Well, well, maybe someone else on your trip had one, Catherine. Oh, I, undoubtedly the <laughs> Rogers got good pictures. I mean, you know, the Rogers are great photographers. Yeah. So, so, so anyway. Kevin, this is Catherine. That was me giving you a hard time about the green bulls. <laughs> I didn't have the heart to show a blurry green bull. <laughs> okay. Um, fabulous, fabulous. Old work. Old, old world is Africa and plus Eurasia. That is from uh, a uh, Catherine. Uh, what was your photo kit? There was a question. What was your photo kit? My photo kit. Nikon. I had an I had an eighty to four hundred zoom lens, and a Nikon D eight ten camera. Okay. I hope that answered the person's question. Because a lot of people on the on the trip had Nikon um, telephoto like Nikon lenses. Um, or Canon, I'm sorry, Canon. A lot Canon. of people had Canon, I'm sorry. Uh, one, people, people were saying, this is a typical of what we've been reading here. Wonderful photos, stories, and impressions. Thank you for sharing all of this, Kevin. Okay, you think I could have written that. It's just, it's just so on point about tonight's show. Let's see. Uh, okay, somebody would like to have the, um, the name of your guide and the email website of avian safaris okay um, um was it avian yeah, safari kevin avian i've got safari. this is catherine i've got this i'll type it in the chat thanks catherine thanks catherine um and then uh, uh there, there's a, a friend sarah she said thanks kevin brought back memories i hyped up to see the gorillas 
twice in Rwanda in the 80s when I worked as a cook for overseas adventure tours. Wow, that's cool. Uh, and Australia is not included in the uh, old world because it is on the other side of the Wallace line. Okay, thank you. I learned something. Um, let's see. Someone wanted to know if you could quickly show the first 10 slides again because they came in late, I think. Um, mm. uh, so that's up to you. Um, no. Let's go back see. to the beginning. Same Just a reminder that, it, that it'll go on YouTube uh, later this week. That's true. OK. This was, I, think this, we'll, I think we'll do it that way. The recording will be on E2, 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 E2. <laughs> YouTube, <laughs> on the uh, Yolo Audubon YouTube channel. Uh, and when that is ready to roll, uh, that will be posted on the Yolo Audubon website. Cool, okay. And so in the chat, Catherine has put the name of the uh, guide and, and who is the owner of Avian Safaris. Perfect. Um, and so that is, uh, it'll be there for a little while. So it's at the bottom, near the bottom of the chat. So if that's information you want it, that's where it's located right now in the, near the bottom of the chat. And again, additional folks are saying, thank you so much, Kevin, as, as am I and Yolo Audubon. Um, Ann, you have anything, or Zane, anything you want to add? No, wake no up. thanks so much, uh, <laughs> Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, then. Uh, folks, I want to thank you tonight um, for joining us tonight. I want to really, I mean, I don't know if you could hear it, but give Kevin another round of applause for this wonderful. Uh, entertaining presentation tonight. Uh, uh, excellent sharing. Let's see. Can I hope you can hear that? <laughs> I can. Thank you. All right. So, <laughs> Kevin, thank you so much. Everyone else, thank you for showing, for uh, joining us. And I wish you all a great rest of the evening. Good night, folks. I hope I can see you all in person soon. Yeah. Oh, and join us next month for, um, oh, one of those seabirds. Um, Marbled Mirrorlets. Yeah, it is. Marble Mirrorlets next 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 month. Uh, be in March, it'll be at the same, unless this is leap year, it'll be uh, March 17th. Everybody's right. kind of closed. Okay, folks. Good night. <laughs>